Hello and welcome to this presentation on simultaneous calibration of analog phased array elements using orthogonal coding. My name is Michael Fogel. I'm Director of Technology Development with ETS Lindgren and it's my pleasure to take you through this topic. As a brief outline, we're going to go through an introduction to orthogonal codes and how to apply that coding to the array measurements, then talk a little bit about our test setup and the results that we had before we finish up putting it all together. Now, predicting or correcting the performance of a phased array requires noting the radiation pattern of each element, as well as the actual gain and phase for each setting of the control circuitry behind the element, as well as how those interact with other elements in the array. Now, an obvious approach to calibration requires measuring one element at a time, disabling all of the others, but that sequential approach multiplies the required test time by the number of elements. So for a large array, that can be painful. Now, the other thing, though, that happens is that element-to-element -element interaction, such as mutual coupling, can differ based on the state of the controlling circuitry. And if I don't have all the elements on, the heating of the circuitry itself could be different, and the loading could be different, so that could cause a nonlinear behavior as well. Now, ideally, what we'd like to do is measure a full pattern and extract the individual antenna elements from that pattern with all of the elements enabled. Now, there are some different techniques out there, like tickle tones, to extract discrete information from combined signals, but usually that requires specialized circuitry in the design for the purpose of testing that won't necessarily be used in real life. So here we're going to investigate the use of orthogonal coding using the existing gain and phase control circuitry that will be on the antenna in order to try to extract that average performance of the element from the measured total result. Now what we're talking about is essentially the same technology that was used in CDMA 2G cell phone technologies and that, that actually used orthogonal coding with Walsh codes to be able to transmit multiple user signals simultaneously. Now, Walsh codes are based on the Hadamard matrix, which is essentially a order 2N matrix defined recursively by building a 2x2 two two matrix using the, the following definition. So you, you can actually start from H equals 1, and then you use the recursive relationship defining the H2N matrix as the previous version of the matrix being plus on three corners and minus on the, the fourth. And so you can kind of see how this builds up through different matrices as you recurse through it. Now the advantage here, of course, is the, the recursive nature of the definition makes it easy to obtain the value of any cell with just a recursive algorithm. So you don't have to recreate this or pre-create this matrix. You can use it on the fly, essentially. Now, the Hadamard matrix of any order has a couple of properties. The, the first is that the average of the first row is always 1, and every other row is 0, and that it's an orthogonal matrix. So being orthogonal, the dot product of each row vector with any other row or each column with every other column is 0. And, of course, the other side of this is that the inverse is simple as well. And so the inverse of the Hadamard matrix is just the normalized uh, Hadamard matrix. So you divide by n in order to get the inverse. And so that makes it easy to solve for any input vector, real or uh, complex, from the resultant output vector. So you can reverse this process. Now, to apply this to the array, we need an appropriate modulation. And so we want to take that plus and minus one of the matrix and use any multiplicative property of the array elements, which includes gain and phase, i.e. the complex S21. So, those signals are linearly summed at the receiving measurement antenna, and so that means that we can actually extract them using this idea of a Hadamard matrix. Now, it's important that the, the modulation scheme maintains the orthogonality and that we don't have something that loses information, essentially. Now, by definition, any phased array can be expected to have phase control. So at a minimum, even if I only had uh, a single bit phase control that let me do 0 or 180 degrees on the phased array, that's enough to do binary phase shift keying. So this should be pretty easy to do on just about any array. Now, granted, typically I have more bits than that, so I could choose any arbitrary reference. I could do plus or minus 90 degrees versus the 0 and 180 would give me the same effect. Now, alternately, we could do amplitude modulation by toggling the element on or off or nearly off by applying a high attenuation. And so our test setup 
what we did was we used a, an 8x8 phased array that we obtained from University of California in San Diego. And we mounted that in our AMS 5700, and we actually added an absorber shroud, as you can see there, around the feed section to try to minimize any coupling that we're getting off of the cable itself and the, the circuit elements going up to the array. A dual polarized horn is used as the measurement antenna at basically a range of one meter. We're operating at 29.3 gigahertz to maximize the signal to interference plus noise of the system. And we're doing the only the co-polarized component, although we measure both. And then an Arduino interface actually controls everything. And so what we get is if we take that setup and we just measure a uh, pattern with everything set at maximum amplitude, zero degrees phase, we get this beam form pattern. And you see, because we aren't doing any amplitude tapering or anything, we've got some pretty good side lobes. But overall, it's, it's a reasonable looking pattern for this size array. Now, if we iterate through each element with those same settings, we get a pretty good spread across all of the different patterns. So this is what we really want to be able to correct for is the, the fact that all of these different elements aren't giving us the exact same pattern, and the path losses through the circuitry could be different too. Now, the zeroth element in this data set is with everything turned off. So this is the leakage. This is what's coming through with the cables. And you'll see that, okay, we've got, at, at the center, we've got a decent signal-to-noise ratio or signal-interference ratio, but it's, it's not non-zero. That, that leakage is uh, going to impact what we measure. Now, of course, if we took and we add all those up, what we should get is the original array pattern. And for the most part, we do. That's the green curve now. But what you see is that, yes, the shape is right, at least for the first side lobe, but there's about an 8 dB difference in magnitude, and the side lobes don't look a lot uh, alike once you get out off to the edge. So we looked a little bit, and it's like, well, is that signal to interference or signal to noise? And the reality is if you compare left to right, you see that that doesn't really reflect what's going on. So that's not necessarily what the problem is here. To apply the Hadamard matrix, because it's 2N, we've got a 64-element array, which means that I need 64 states. So a 64, 4 by 64 matrix should work. But when you start looking at that, uh, there are a few things that come up that should be apparent. The first is that this first row is all ones. And so there's something unique about that row versus all the others. So the element that gets all ones is, is a problem, partly because if you think about what I'm not modulating, I'm not modulating the leakage coming from the cable. So that's the signal that has all ones is that leakage from the cable. So I really don't want to use that for an element because I won't be able to distinguish it from the cable effects. Now, of course, the first column is also all ones. And so what you should realize is that, well, what that means is that at least for the first symbol of whatever I modulate, it's this beam form pattern. So there's something odd there as well that could be a, potentially a problem. In order to fix this, the thought was, well, let's go ahead and go up to 128-bit code word uh, and reserve that first code for the leakage code. And of course, we have to go to 128 bits because of that 2 to N. So I can't go from 64 to 65. I have to go 64 to 128. Now, the advantage there is, is that we do have more possible codes we could use. So if we wanted to use every other code or do something else, uh, we have that ability as well. If I start with the BPSK and run through and do that, I get patterns. I get something that looks relatively reasonable, but the leakage is still showing up as though it's a, an in-phase pattern. So it, it doesn't really look like the leakage that we had when we measured before. So it, it's obvious that the other elements are kind of leaking through as well, which is, if, if nothing else, it's from that first code where everything's in phase. The question was, is there a way to get rid of that? And so the, the thought is, well, okay, if I modulated the source signal, that would do it. But how do I do that? I'm, I'm trying to just use the control circuitry within the array. I can't take the VNA output and modulate it somehow. But what I can do is I can do a little bit of, of mathematical trickery and do something in post-processing. So 
in this case, each bit of the code is simply an on or off signal for the modulation choice. So I can actually do some binary math and choose the second code, so for example, 101010, and XOR that with every other code that I'm going to send. And so what I've essentially done is I've taken and I've modulated the source signal, the, the thing that I'm not really able to change, by altering all of the other things that I transmit. And then what happens is at the end, I virtually apply that code back and, and decode. So I, I'm basically taking that out and flipping the th things that I measured back and forth in phase by 180 degrees in order to get back to the, the signals that I want. And sure enough, that actually does a pretty good job. That definitely makes a significant difference in this leakage signal. And if you compare, you know, if you look closely at the numbers, you'll see that for the most part, well, the, you know, the, I've still got a little bit of a hump here from the, the peak. I'm on the same order magnitude now as, as what I measured when I turned all the elements off. And I can also run through and look at all the different patterns. And for the most part, you see that while there is a significant difference in amplitude, I'm getting the same pattern, although a few of them you can see that there are some differences. For example, this one right here, where the fact that the neighboring elements are on versus having them off, it shows up. So there's, there are some impacts that we're seeing that are related to the, the different methods of measuring. And so the real question, of course, is does it work? And the answer is yes, it actually works quite well. Now when I take the sum of all of those measured patterns, and put it together, I actually predict the, far, the, the normal pattern with all elements turned on uh, within a dB, and, and certainly I reproduce all the side lobes very well. So I've eliminated whatever was happening out at the edges where the patterns uh, weren't really the same, probably due to make mutual coupling to the neighbors, as well as getting the amplitude right. Now, of course, there are other modulations we can use, the, uh, the book modulation uh, or back, so binary on-off keying or binary amplitude keying. So if you look at these from a constellation standpoint, so BPSK is plus or minus one on the, the in-phase axis. Book is zero and one, right? So the minus one value becomes a zero instead of a minus one. And back is, well, the minus one value is almost zero. So they're very similar conceptually, but I'm using a different component within the chip to, to create this modulation. This is going to suffer some of the same issues that in, impact the iterative approach. Each element is now turned off 50% of the time. So I'm going to have less heating, potentially significantly less. Whenever it's off, the impedance of the element may change. So all of this is kind of getting us back to the same sort of problems that we had. Now our initial test, we actually were getting results that were kind of confusing. We were getting a lot of leakage signal and we were actually getting quite a bit of distortion to the pattern. There were some peaks and nulls at the center. And we looked a lot for coding bugs before discovering that this was actually a physical problem. And it, the, the physical problem is simply that if you think of taking your array and turning off 50% of the elements, all you've done is created a sparse array. The array is still in phase, and all those elements are in phase. So for the most part, unless I got a really odd pattern where occasionally I got the, the beam pointed in a different direction, I'm essentially creating the exact same beam as I would if all the elements were on, just not as strong. And so you can see here, as a function of the codes, there are only a few times within the process that they, they look uh, kind of randomized, if you will. And so the question is, well, can we randomize the element phase? And so with 64 phase steps, we were able to go in and give each element its own phase. We just did it linearly. But what you see now is that as a function of code, the patterns created are much different, and I don't have them all lumping to this main center beam pattern. And when we did that, sure enough, same sort of results. We get the coding coming out. But what happens when we look at the total? We've recreated the pattern well. So we've actually addressed a lot of the mutual coupling issues and this sort of stuff. But we're now about 5 dB different. And that kind of makes sense, is if I've turned only half of the uh, elements off, I, that's 3 dB. So it's like, yes, I've, I've improved this, but not down to that, you know, I'll, 
very close to to one dB type number that we had for the the phase shift. Likewise, now if I do the back, the amplitude keying, where I don't turn it completely off, now I'm quite a bit better. I'm, I'm still a couple of dB off, but leaving all the elements on has uh, addressed that mutual coupling issue uh, for the most part. So basically this describes the technique, gives you some of the pitfalls, but you know there's still quite a bit of work to be done here and Luckily, since we wrote the paper, there, some of this work has been done. So, you know, you want to be able to address things like the uh, error propagation through this, right? Every time I, my gain and phase shifters aren't perfect, that's what I'm trying to calibrate, but I'm getting two different states simultaneously. So what does that do to my result? And we also did this kind of brute force using a VNA and manually triggering the Arduino, but newer chipsets have large buffers where you can iterate through all the array states very quickly. And so you can potentially load these codes into this array and, and grab all of this data in one sweep of an analyzer. You could even use spread spectrum capabilities with a signal analyzer and cover multiple frequencies. So there are now results that have been published where this has been done uh, virtually instantaneously, like in milliseconds uh, of time, to do a full calibration. In terms of some background references, there's this original paper from Lockheed Martin and DARPA uh, talking about this for uh, satellite antennas. There's also a paper from Professor Rubiz at IMS 2021. So to conclude, you know, measuring each element uh, iteratively, it's time consuming and it's probably not gonna give you the correct result. Orthogonal coding gives us a way to extract that individual element performance from a pattern where all the elements are active. And Interactions due to beam forming the array and some other things that happen uh, can be detrimental, so you have to choose the codes right. You have to play some tricks to, to eliminate some of the, the effects that you get. So what's really needed now is a set of rules, essentially, for using this concept. And with that, we'd like to thank Professor Rabiz from UC San Diego for the phased array and bouncing ideas back and forth on this subject. Thank you.